So today we're going to practice our problem, okay? But I highly recommend that you click on the Everybody gets different numbers. Have you noticed in WebSign that sometimes some of the numbers are in red? Right? That's, those are the numbers that are automatically generated. So they're not the same for every student. So one student might have a five there, another student might have a three, so on and so forth. Okay. Um, so I'm going to show you like a problem, and I write on my notes. Show it to you right now. Put those on my screen. Yep. Uh, what you were saying about the red is that meaning that the problem is wrong or something? No, those when you click on the web sign, you get a you get the set of problems, right? Okay, yeah, but yeah. within each problem, there's certain numbers that are red. And sometimes, like if it's a trick function, the trick function might be in red, right? But those red, the only reason it's red is because that's the number that's algorithmically generated. So when you see red, understand that that number that's in red is going to be different for your classmates. Okay, so it's not the same numbers for everybody. It basically, it's supposed to prevent like cheating so that y'all are not like doing the problem together and then only one person did the problem and then both y'all get credit for it, that kind of thing. So they change one little number here and there and then it's supposed to help you. So like, for example, we're not gonna do things yet because I'm gonna explain all this at the beginning. But if you look like here, I have 2.3 example one and I wrote down this problem. And I think the three is in red, if I'm not mistaken. So yours might not be a number a three. If you look at number two in your web assign for 2.3, it might not be a three. It might be a different value, like five or four, whatever, one, eight. Yeah, anything. It could be anything. Okay. So um, I'm just mentioning that I would rather you, instead of trying to practice time, I would rather you try to practice the actual homework problem so that when you finish with it, you know what to play Right. So then as we keep going through all the rest of the examples, I think I have a total of seven or eight of them. I actually have nine of them. And there's only 14 problems in the homework set. So hopefully if we get through all nine, there's no rush. Okay. If we get through all nine, then you would only have five left to do on your own. Okay. And those five that are left to do on your own are actually very similar to the ones that are in the videos in the discussion. So if you do need some help, you can go back to those videos and get help with those other five. And then of course, you can always text me, right? So if you still don't get <laughs> those problems that are similar like the videos, then you can still text me and I can kind of help you walk through whatever problem you're working on with your numbers, okay? Um, but what I am gonna do, because sometimes when I do classes like this, I never know how long to pause, okay? Like how long to wait for everyone to finish doing their problem. And unfortunately, there are going to always be people who work a lot slower than everyone else. It's just a fact, okay? However, I cannot wait until then, right? So if the problem is supposed to take someone two minutes, I can't wait for 20 minutes for someone to finally finish a problem that takes two minutes, right? Um, then we'll only get to like, what, three examples out of the whole nine, right? So what I wanna do to keep that in mind and to help the class flow a little better to maximize what we can cover during class time is I'm gonna use the department rule on the standardized timing for tests, okay? So I don't know if y'all know that. I mean, I, if you took me for a class before, you might've heard me say it once, um, but in our department, the way it works is any assignment or any test or anything that I create for you to do, I'm supposed to take my time and multiply it by three. And if I have to put a time constraint on it, like for example, the test, you guys should be getting three times the amount of time that it took me to take that same test, okay? Now I do try to do two things to help out with that. Me personally, I am super, super, super fast, okay? And I can do a lot of things in my head. So there might be problems where I can just look at it and know the answer. It's gonna take me what a second, right, to figure it out. Whereas when I'm doing the test, 
I like to explain and write down every single step on my logic, what I did in my head, absolutely everything I write down. Not only does that buy you time, right? Because you're going to get three times that amount of time, right? With me doing all that mess. <laughs> but then it also helps me so that I have a, a nice uh, answer key. So if somebody were confused about a problem, they could go back to my answer key and they would know how to do that problem in detail, okay? So I really do that. I, when I take my test, I'm literally making my answer key at the same exact time. So I try to make it nice and neat. I try to make it like, you know, explained real well. Um, not that that's what I'm expecting from every single student to do. It's just how I do it so that I can buy you more time to take the test. Does that make sense? And I'm doing two jobs in one by getting my solutions knocked out at the same time. Okay. So with that in mind, this is the way we're going to work today. I also want y'all to start getting used to how long it should take you to do these problems, okay? Because a lot of times you'll do them and you're not realize, like, oh, it took me 10 minutes to do that problem. And you're thinking, hey, I'm good. I did it in 10 minutes. And I'm like, no, that's a one minute problem. It should not be taking you 10 minutes to do that problem. If it's taking you 10 minutes to do that problem, you're going to be in a world of trouble on the test when you only get three times my time, right? So that's why I kind of wanted to start keeping this in the back of your mind. And so if I, I think personally, if we kind of have that in the background as the driver of time, then we should be able to do pretty good on these tests if we're able to knock this stuff out in class, okay? So what we're gonna do is, I know you probably already started, but <laughs> um, we're gonna, when we get to I'm going to time myself on my phone how long it took me to finish that problem. You guys are going to be working on it at the same time I took you, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this time, whatever it is, and I'm going to multiply it by two. That's the extra time that you're going to get before I say, okay, time's up, so you can move on to the next example. Okay? And we won't just move on to the next example. We'll actually go over the solution so everybody's on the same playing field before we continue with the next problem. Does that make sense? Everybody's okay with that? <laughs> I know I got a lot of explaining to do at the beginning, but once we start going, it'll be okay. Okay, so I did review the discussions. And so I noticed that there were three things that came up. And one of them was about like having to write um, the limit thing, right? So like when you're doing a problem, you have to write limit as x goes to whatever you can find. And then you have your expression. And then every single time you do something to that expression, you're having to write limit every single time, right? That's the way I'm doing it because I'm formal. I'm a professor. I'm supposed to be doing it that way. That's what you see in the book. It, that's what it's supposed to go, okay? However, someone asked, do I really have to do that? And the answer to be plain and simple is no, okay? However, what you have to do is you have to say, I'm doing my side work over here. And you do all of your math. Okay, and then once you're done with that, once you have that final simplification, that's the only other time you have to write limit. Okay, so when you do that final simplification, write that in here and then take the actual limit and then you can give me your answer. Okay, um, what I don't want you to do because it's not formal is to try to do all of your side work in here and then tell me down here all of a sudden put the limit back in. Okay. So make sure that if you are going to be doing stuff without having the right limit on each step, that you do it to the side, okay? And then that way I see where that came from, and then I know how you got to your final answer, okay? So that was one thing I wanted to clarify. Um, the second thing that I saw was um, there were and there was a couple of people that were talking about the trick stuff. Um, two things with the trick. One, you definitely want to have like just a basic knowledge, not nothing too crazy. Um, but if you notice on the back of this sheet, this sheet that I gave you guys in class, right? On the back of it, you do have some trick formulas. Okay. So it's not nothing that you have to memorize per se. Um, but we definitely need to know that these are there on that sheet. So that if you do make these functions, you do have some responsibility. Um, do not expect this to just <laughs> with nothing, okay? You will have this sheet of paper when you're taking your test. And if you're taking your test online, you're still going to have the electronic version of this paper, okay? 
you just scroll up when you need it and scroll back down to your problem and read it so you don't need it, okay? Um, but I just wanted you to be aware that you do have that. It is a tool. Nobody's going to take that away from you, okay? Um, you also have your calculator. So if you have to evaluate for something, you can use the tools in your calculator. They're not something you have to memorize, okay? The only thing is be careful in your calculator because your calculator has decimal mode and radian mode, right? So if the problem has like pies and stuff, you need to make sure you're in radian mode, okay? And then if it has a decim the decimal, the degrees, then it needs to be in degree mode, okay? So that's basically the only thing. Um, so I don't want you to get scared <laughs> about the trig stuff. Plus, I like to make sure that I cover the trig stuff whenever we get to that, okay? Um, just because it does require some review of it. And then the last thing, somebody said that they didn't understand this, and I don't know what it was about it that was not understood. So I'm trying to explain it. <laughs> so instead of just leaving your number, I just put one in there. Okay. And so if I'm trying to take the limit of x, as x approaches one, what I like to do is look at the graph to take a figure, right? So this is my function in here. So if that's my function, then I basically need to graph the line y equals x. Okay. And so this is the graph y equals x, right? When x is one, y is one. When it's 13, y is 2, when it's 0, y is 0, so on and so forth, right? That's the graph we agree to. <laughs> okay. So then as I look at this, when I'm looking for the minute as x goes to 1, I'll um, back here, and the y value is actually also going to bump into 1. Okay. So that means that my y value is going to 1. And that's exactly what you're looking for when you're taking the limit. You know, where does the y value go, right? So that means that my limit is 1. Which means that my Notice the row and notice what I have over there. Whatever number here isn't at the same number there. Because if I plug that number into my function x, I'm going to get that same number back out, right? Yes. Whatever the y value is going to. Yes. It may not be where it's defined. Remember those weird problems with the hole, and then all of a sudden there's a dark circle right below it, right? So the limit might have been up here, but then the actual value is down there. But yes, it's always where the y is going. Okay. And then this right here, whatever you're taking the limit of, is a function that you can take to the graph. Okay. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with this? Okay. You could still already do the same thing for x squared or whatever. Okay. And you'll essentially get the same kind of concept. Essentially, what you're doing is you're just plugging this in to the function like this. And you have to see the limit. The only time that causes problems is when you have those, what are they called, indeterminate form things, right? Where you try to go look at the function and the function is doing this, <laughs> or they're both going up or they're both going down, right? Um, those are the times when you have those, those uh, indeterminate forms. And then you have to like manipulate the function in order to get something that you can actually evaluate. Okay, so we're gonna start off simple, nothing too, too, too crazy. We're going to do example. Um, it's actually number two from WebAssign. So I highly recommend that you do your problem from WebAssign and not this one if yours is not a three. But go ahead and try it. I'm going to do this one. And then we're, I'm going to try it.
me and I have already moved on to the next one and that's okay because you saw it earlier, but you should be done by now. How long does this one take? How long did it take you? A couple of seconds, right? <laughs> it doesn't take very long because I had to come over here, mess with my phone <laughs> and then write everything out. It took me 20 seconds to do the problem, okay? Um, but essentially you should have done something like this. Did you do this? This one was nice and sweet, right? It literally just required direct substitution. You just plugged in that one and there was nothing funny happening here, right? No zeros on the denominator or anything weird. So we got the answer, it's very, very straightforward, okay? Yes. I mean, just try to make sure that you understand it, right? Some of you have already worked on 2.3, but I don't think anybody had 100. So try this one. Now this one will require you to use a calculator, right? I don't know if everybody, well, I don't know if everybody got the same values or not. I think the 11 might be different from everybody's. Okay, we should be done with that one. Let me show you this one. So again, we could use direct substitution, right? We plug in the 11 and now we're doing So what I did was I did 11 times this one, I did two times and did the last one whole time, but it's just for notation. Um, and then I had to put a common denominator that that's not what I did there. And then I know many of the findings that this had a multiple term with the calculator. Okay. But again, I like to try to use a calculator as least amount as possible. <laughs> also, when I'm doing the solutions on a review or a test as well, just because it buys me more time the more I do myself. Yes. Sure. You want me to enter the decimal? No, you have to enter and actually. So, well, you shouldn't be entering pi at all, right? But if you did have to enter an actual number, let's just have it under a different pi. The way you would write it would you would write 11 times divided by 6. Okay. But that's not the answer. So, that's not what we're going to answer by. In my case, the answer was negative 1. 
and so negative one would be what goes in the box. Okay. Um, I don't know what yours is. Kind of whatever what that comes out to be. Ah, yes, good ticket. Yeah, right. mm -hmm. right? yeah. yeah. Good, good, good. Okay, we're going to go to the next one. Go ahead and write that down. This one is like number four, part C. Okay, so number four, part C. We're going to have a time for me to come up with a whole word about part C. So look at what your functions are and do the problem with whatever your functions are or whatever your C value is. You may not have the same C value either. So number four, part C. Okay, I'm going to go over this one. So again, your numbers and your functions might be a tiny bit different. But for mine, I did do some side work. Okay. So what I did here is I had two functions. I had x plus x plus x. And I had x plus x. I think it's the first one. Okay. So I had x plus x plus x. And then I think the little number that you're going to for x is c-value. That might be a little bit different. Okay. But what I like to do is I like to take side work by figuring out what the heck is going to be first. So I wrote d of f of x, that's what you're trying to get over to do. I know that f of x is x plus 3, right? So then I want to know what d of x plus 3 is. So what does that mean? That means I have to plug in x plus 3 and d to the next. So it actually looks like x plus 3 is the okay? Now that I know what my composition function looks like, I only do need to plug it back into the middle. We replace that in notation with what it is. And then I try direct substitution. So when I plugged in my 4, I ended up with 7 squared, which is Anybody have any questions about that one? So might have made you recall back what composition were, right? The colors are the room. So that might be like a little branch thrown in there. <laughs> Uh-huh. Oh, where you see this? This bisector is not great. I can see this also. But this, by definition, means this. That's 
that we're going to need later. And this idea, oh, I'm going to come back. There's like a whole section on just this. Because eventually, we're going to eventually learn about this derivative thing. And the functions can look crazy. And, and to avoid me having to Actually, cube that too. Let's go in the same way. Let's put a cube. I'm definitely not doing that, right? I don't think any of us are going to waste an hour to try to figure out what that is. Okay. So, if they ask me to take the derivative of it, I'm going to have to be able to identify what's the inside function and what's the outside function. So, in here, the inside function is what's inside the parentheses. And then the outside function will just be a giant F to the E minus L. Okay, so this composition idea will come back to us in our 6.5 or something like that. So it will come back. Okay. I try to make sure that we don't go too fast through that chapter three because that chapter three is literally the heart of this whole course. Okay. Right now we're kind of trying to warm you up into the algebra stuff and getting you used to this limit idea, only because the limit is actually how they define the derivative. So that's the purpose of why we're doing limits. Okay. And we're getting some algebra warm up at the same time in this chapter. Okay. okay, let's go ahead and go to the next one. So the next one is going to be like number seven. So look in your web assign and find your number seven. It may or may not have these exact same numbers, but I highly doubt it. You might get lucky. <laughs> you could get those same numbers in here. But it's number seven. Okay. And if you already did your homework, you could practice the one that I have up here. Okay. I know there weren't very many people that had finished it, but I know that there were some people that had started it for sure. Okay, so for this one, I actually brought up something that was going on. So I solved it. It took me about 45 seconds to do it. Um, and here's what I did. So at first, I just plugged in the number because that's what I had been doing, right? So I tried to plug in the three where both of the X's were. 
but it turns out that I got zero over zero, which is one of those indeterminate terms, right? Anytime you get zero at the bottom, it really don't matter what's at the top, it's, it's bad, okay? Um, so, so I think that's an interesting question. That's what we said. We can't have to simplify this expression somehow, so that I could plug in the so what I did was I factored the denominator of the So maybe x plus three times x minus three, and then that caused this factor to be factored to zero. Okay. So now that I have nothing on top, it doesn't matter. I don't care if that goes one or one. Okay. Um, and then the x plus three is at the bottom. Now I want to like try to plug in this, and then I ended up with that factor to be six. However, they pointed out to me that in the computer. Not only does it ask you what the limit is, but it also asks you for this function g of x. Okay. What they're asking you for is what you what your function simplified to before you plugged in the number. Okay. So in my case, this is what it simplified to before I plugged in the number. Okay? So that's the g of x function that's asking. What's the function after that? Right. After you simplify it. That's the function they want in there. You got it. So for me, I would be typing in this. Okay. And when you do try to type that in there, a little low. Uh, I don't know what they call it. I think they call it a palette. But when you type in here, there should be like a palette that opens up that allows you to select an expression. And then it opens up like two little boxes in the top and the bottom. You can type in the one at the top and the second one. Go ahead and try your number eight. I'm sure doing with yours. If you need to use my numbers, go ahead. We've already done it. For different yeah. For different yeah. For different yeah. For 
Yeah, for some of you, then it's plus and then it's first. But I'm going to talk this one out because a lot of you got, I know almost everyone got at least halfway as far as realizing that it was an indeterminate form. So it did tell us our units that I have, right? And then I have to have those at least four or zero units. Right? I think it's going to happen. So then, I mean, I obviously will simplify this question somehow. And so since they are quadratic, I go ahead and find the factor. Again, your freshman was with more college on the roof than I might have. Maybe one of my class. Um, and so then, we have two factors. So these two numbers multiply the thing that I don't think they give me any, they give me probably the first, right? And then the bottom, that's what we're going to do. So if this guy came out, and then that guy would be 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, they want the one after you take the five. Okay. Then I went ahead and tried to plug in my thing, and it went fine this time. I got ten over four, which I reduced to five over three. Nice thing about your calculator is if you do type in ten over four in your calculator, if it can be reduced and you hit enter, it will reduce it for you. It's gonna come in handy when you get like ten thousand something something in the numerator, and then like five hundred something something on the bottom. <laughs> You won't know if it's going to reduce or not, but if you type it in here, it'll tell you. Okay, that's nice. Um, but I did end up with for me my answer was five over two, and the computer will accept because that is a nice decimal, right? It's an exact decimal. When I do five divided by two, it's like what two point five. I could type that in my calculator. I mean, the computer it will accept it. Okay, if the denominator was three though. That would be like 1.6. I cannot type 1.6 in my calculator because that's not the actual answer. The answer is 1.6 repeating 6. Okay? And so it won't count it right if it's a, a fraction that cannot be written as a, what they call the terminating decimal. Okay? So the decimal just keeps going and going and going. You cannot type that decimal with a sign. It has to type in the fraction version. I just thought that was worth mentioning because I had some people in my Cal 2 class that do that, kind of type in 1.6, and it was like telling them, no, 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 no. And they're like, I know it's right. And I'm like, well, yeah, the step before that was right when we had 5 over 3. But <laughs> when you try to chop that number up and it's not asking it around, don't do that. Okay. So the big clue is, is if you see round in the question, then go ahead and you can round. But if you don't see anywhere that it says round to a certain decimal place, then keep your answers as fractions or radicals or whatever they are. Okay, okay cool. so let's go ahead. This one's gonna take a lot of time. I even wrote it on my own paper because it's gonna take me some time. So <laughs> definitely have extra time to walk around. Okay, but try this one. And before you start it, I know you watched the videos. Most of you did. Um, what is the trick to doing this one? Go ahead. Multiply by the conjugate, and you multiply what by the conjugate? The top and the bottom by the conjugate. So if you make the conjugate, are you doing the conjugate of the numerator or the denominator? You're doing the numerator. Like this guy, right? And conjugate is either this whole guy stays the same, that whole guy stays the same, but the sign in the middle is different. Do your numbers, please do, so you can get it for credit, right? This is number nine now. This is number nine, yes. Oh, and I don't have nine. Yes, I do. 
I have seven examples, not nine examples. <laughs> Give me a moment and then I'm sure it's going to take me a minute so I'll be able to walk around for longer.
<laughs> okay, this one I recommend don't don't pull the bottom one out. The blue one. The reason why is because this is going to come from the top. Uh, um, and so then this tail the top one out like that. That one's not so The pose would be after you do all of these, you're supposed to get it. <laughs> Um, so here we go with this one. Um, this was what I was explaining. Remember when I said you could do it like this, right? You just have to do your side work on the side, right? Go ahead and talk to Riley. Learn it, learn it, learn it, learn it, learn it all the way down. I just did all the algebra on the side, and then once I had my subtraction, I said, oh, with this side, I'm going to do this. And then from there, I plugged in zero and one, and then I simplified. Okay? I just had to write in it on all of my steps today. Okay? The cowboy is telling me to do this step on five, it's easier than that. Okay? So, here's where the experience comes in. You really were supposed to look at the time. These two guys are exactly the same, just instead of a minor, just instead of plus sign, we did it as I'm talking about. But with experience, you'll realize that as you do this stuff and stuff, somehow it starts to always look up to like what was originally at the bottom. Okay? And so what I, and then I even did it too, I totally forgot. <laughs> I erased my denominator. But then I remembered, oh, don't multiply this thing out. Because you're going to want to uh, cancel that one part, right? This is the factor that's causing the issue. Because when I try to plug in one, it's that denominator that's turning to zero that's the problem, isn't it? So that's essentially what you're trying to get rid of when you're using the conjugate. Okay? So don't multiply it out because it's not preventing this part in your way. Okay? So it just so happened when I did, I did like foils and different radicals. I did this radical times that radical, same thing. So it's essentially that thing squared. Right? Then I did the radical times the positive two, and I got positive two with the radical. Did the negative, I got negative two with the radical, and then negative two times positive two times the negative two. Right? The bottom, I literally just put that in parentheses, 
and that is where it's going to be. They're building support for the network, but I'm not going to do that. Okay? Then these two guys are exactly the same, but one positive and one negative, right? So those truly do cancel. Okay? When you add and subtract, they cancel. When you divide, they reduce. Okay? So you see the vocabulary there. I personally always said cancel, regardless. Whenever I'm talking about one of my fellow cancel students, they always say, like, uh uh uh, it's not cancel when it's reduced. It's just reduced. Reduce. So now I tell everybody, don't say cancel when you get to here. <laughs> They reduce. Okay. So I did cancel these because it was out of the track. And when you square a square root, it doesn't make it to pop the hell off. Okay. So it's just that square for me. And then this little little guy right next to it. I did combine my like terms. And so again, I just look at what happened. Then I turn it to the side of the bar. And so this is quote unquote reduce. Okay. But remember, when you have nothing left at the top, there's always that imaginary one factor. Okay. And then I have just what was in this parenthesis at the bottom. But the fact that I don't have like something in the parenthesis is what is going to allow me to add and reduce the dimension of the graph. So I took that expression, and that's what I have here now. And then I can go ahead and plug in my one. Also, not that I deemed a bunch of points because I just got my final, but if you're already plugging in the numbers, don't let L I M go in here. Okay, because the act of you plugging in the number means you're already taking the limit, so you don't need to tell me that you're going to take the limit. That makes sense? This is telling me that you have to take the limit. When you're actually already doing it, you don't need to tell me you're going to be doing it. You're doing it. Okay? Um, and then that turns out to be 4, which ends up being 2, so then I end up getting 4 all together. Anybody have questions about this one? I mean, no, it's green and say that, right? Especially with those radicals. I have a question. So, sure. could you get through the square root? Mm -hmm. Is that half uh, uh, square root of x minus 3 all the way up the top? Now, when you come down, yeah. no, right there, right there. No, no, come down, right there, just left. So, then when you come down to the next part of your equation, is that where you start doing in your limit? Like, my limit over here is 45. So, is that where I start replacing x with 45? Not yet until you simplify for this as much as you simplify. So we put all simplify and you cancel that that problem child. When you've gotten rid of this problem child down here, that's when it'll be simplified. Because I'm pretty sure yours is like x minus 45. Yeah, that's my And you can't plug in the 45 because you went to zero down there. Yeah, I went to zero down there. So make sure you get rid of that, and then you can plug in the Good, good, good. Okay, last one, and then I'll just let y'all freely work on your web assign. I'll go around and ask questions after this one, and then, or you can ask questions of me. And then if you're done with your web assign, you're free to go, okay? I did push back 2.1 and 2.2. .2. I know most of you already all did it. There were a couple of like 80s, and I think one person that hadn't had the chance to get into it yet. Um, but it's because there was like some issue going on on the last class period. And when I went into WebAssign, they said like the system was experiencing issues. And if you're in it, then you can stay in it, but don't log out because you won't be able to get back in. <laughs> it was crazy going on on that Wednesday. So I knew that there were people that probably wanted to go home and continue and they weren't able to. So I did push those dates back. Okay, So everything 2.1, 2.2 and 2.3 are pushed until Friday. Okay, So as long as you go in there and you get them done by Friday, you'll be fine. Okay, and 11.59 p.m. is what it is on Friday. Okay, so get that my text. You can text me, okay? <laughs> Please do. I prefer you text me than to email me, only because I'm not always at my desk seeing the emails come in, um, but I am always with my phone and it beeps, right? Um, so I definitely suggest that you text me in that remind thing. Um, and I can help you. Like I said, I did no problem with that. Doesn't even matter if I'm in the car, I'll tell my daughter now she drives. So go drive like I answer this question real quick and then we'll switch again. So anything I gotta do to answer you, I will do it. Okay. Yes. So <laughs> it's probably in there. I didn't see it. Okay. Um there we go. So you do your number 12. This one's in correct. So number 12 in your I had videos for some of those other trig ones, but I didn't 
but that one is the plus four. But I didn't go over this one in the video. So I wanted to make sure we talked about it. So try to do your number 12. I think the difference you'll see is the seven. Yours might not be a seven. Okay. Okay, I'm going to minimize this and then we'll go for it. So it's limit as x goes to zero of sine with some power x and then x at the bottom. Number 12, yes. Yeah, but in order to break it down, it would be, I mean, for, for me, it would be four or five. That's what it seems like. It seems like some sort of weird one that you can put in short of the description. I mean, I didn't know how to do 10 either. I don't remember all the three that I did. For science, it uh, went over. No, for science, yeah, it went over why that. Yeah, I
equips me, but again, that's because I know what I'm doing, right? Um, took me about a minute and 15 seconds. So here is the problem. So I first tried to plug in the zero. I plugged in the zero, I plugged in the zero. Okay, so it is this, and then sine of zero is actually zero, and then zero to the second power is zero to zero. Right? So I have one of those numbers in the form, zero to zero. So then that means I do need to manipulate this in some way. And so the first thing I did was I used one fact, and then I used the second fact. So the first fact that I used was this rule which you will have on a note sheet when you take your test. But I use this rule equals one, okay? And then the other rule I used is that if I have the limit of two functions multiplied together, we are allowed to take the limit of those individually and then just multiply the results together. So I tried to split the exponent into just one sine x times the smaller sine x, right? So that when I multiply together, it's the same thing as sine to the second power. Then I tried to split this as a fraction. So one fraction was what I needed times the other x was left. Okay? And so that's what I have here. I have this, and then times the sine squared. Well, nothing at the bottom, so I just did a fraction. Then over here, when I split it up, I use this rule now. I'm taking the limit of this factor times the limit of this other factor. I do write it out. Okay? And then I know that according to that top rule up here, that this whole thing is just going to become a one. Okay? And then for that one, if it's over one, I don't have to write it in the comments. Okay? The and I just direct substituted by plugging in the zero. Remember what this means. It means sine of zero to the power of six, right? Sine of zero is zero, and zero to the power of six is still zero. But that one times that zero is just going to be zero. So the answer there is actually zero. Yes? How do we remove the sine x and the x? Good question. Do I cover it in the video? Or just tell you what it is? Do I cover it in the video? Anybody remember? Did I use the word sweet there? No, you. Talk about <laughs> okay, so here we go. This is what's happening here. We know that sine of x is a number between negative one and one. Why do I know that? The unit circle, right? This is the, the biggest x, the biggest y values here are what? Negative one and one. Even if you graph the sine wave, it looks like this, right? What's the highest and the lowest values are one and negative one, right? So no matter what my angle is, the value of this will be between negative one and one. Then what we do, what we always do with equations or inequality, is we do the same thing to all the sides. So we divide by x, divide by x, divide by x, right? So then here we have negative one over x, less than or equal to sine x over x, less than or equal to one over x. Then I go ahead and I take the limit of these zeros as x goes to zero. I write it. It's annoying. I know you think it's annoying. Trust me, I think it's annoying too. But I'm not doing it. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. A very, very good question. I asked the same thing when I took this test. <laughs> so I'm totally with you there. Like, what? Why? Okay. Then I like to use graphs just because I know how to graph. Not everyone does. But you should know how to graph the reciprocal function. It looks like this. This is the graph of 1 over x. Now, if I want to graph, um, actually, no, I did this wrong. Negative 1 over x, it should look like the other way, right? This reciprocal. So it should look like that. Oh, dun, 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 dun. I'm not explaining this right. It happens to not be this. What happens if you approach these things as x goes to zero? What is this going to become? Mm -hmm. This is the 
there because it's so that you don't think of until somebody shows it to you. And they're like, oh, there, that's what's going on. That's what I needed to do. And that's essentially what this class is. It's just for us to show you all the little tricks and techniques to get to those answers. Okay. Sure. Which one are you doing? Number 10? And what does it look like for you? Times step over seven X? Yes. Yes. Right. And so then you're basically doing the limit of this and then the limit of that separate. And the limit of this is one, and the limit of a constant is the same constant, right? Yep. Now I did notice, and I don't think it was this class, I don't remember. Um because I do have another calculus one, it's just the online version, okay? But I did notice that somebody in the discussion said something like, if I'm doing this problem, I know the answer is gonna be three over four. And the reason why they did it was because they did something like this. They brought out the three and then the four, and then they brought the three and the four outside the limit. And then they had sine x over x, which is just the big fat one, right? And so they were like, okay, well, I got square three over four, just like you did. Well, they are, they're showing steps, right? But what they did was, is they showed me a step that is not the okay? This numerator is not the same thing as this. It's not. In order for that to be equivalent to this, it has to be true no matter what x is, no matter what x is. And if I type in x as pi over 3, I'm going to have 3 times pi over 3, which is just pi, right? And so I have pi, what? 0. Okay? Whereas if I type pi over 3 here, I'm going to get like a square root of 2 over 2, and 3 times a square root of 2 over 2 is 3 square root of 2 over 2. Not the same thing as 0, right? So you cannot ever take a number out of an angle. Don't ever do that, ever, 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 okay? There's some formulas that we have where I can write this as like sine of x and cosine of 2x or sine of 2x and cosine of x. There's other formulas we can use, but none of them require you to do the calculation, okay? And so if you did this on the test, it would be completely wrong because you take the fact that it's just something like this, okay? <laughs> and that's the hard part about this class is that there's so many rules and properties that you've seen throughout the way, right? But it's hard to remember them all. And so then sometimes you're like, I think I could do that and you just do it. And that was the difference between me getting all 100s in my math classes versus my classmates not having any earthly idea what was going on. Is that I could tell you exactly what rule I used to get from there to there. I could tell you every single rule, every single exponent rule, log rule, anything. I could tell you exactly what rule I used to get that next line. 
And that literally was the difference because they'd be like, how'd you get a hundred? And I'm like, how'd you not? <laughs> like, you should be able to tell me what you're doing on every single step. And that, that just is what helped me. Not everyone wants to do that, but that is how I figured out whether or not I could do what I wanted to do. Is if I had some rule that back me up. Keep working on your assignments. If you are done with your when you are free to go. Um, Okay, so then what you want in order for you to use that rule, the rule says what the one minute that it takes to use the so essentially what it's saying is that whatever this angle is, it has to match that down there. Yeah. Okay. So what you need is you need a six down here. Okay. So if you multiply by six over six, that'll get you the six at the bottom. And then this six at the top can factor outside the bottom. So what it will eventually look like is the limit x goes to zero, six, five, six, and then over six. This guy will come out. Okay. Whatever you get the idea. Yeah. <laughs> and then when they match, it'll this whole thing will just be a one. Yeah. And then six That's times the one. Exactly. Okay. Okay.
see, so when you plug in time here,
I'll be right there.